Okay, so let me um, restate something that I mentioned last time because I forgot an important hypothesis. And um, just to review as well. So we had uh, two coverings of a space X. And what I neglected to mention is that we want to, we need to assume that these spaces are connected. And um, so we fix base points y0, y0 prime, both going to x0 under the projections. These are coverings. And then the statement is that y is isomorphic to y prime if um, and only if the images of the corresponding fundamental groups are the same. So here isomorphism means that phi is a map that composed with P um, prime gives you P and um, we want this to preserve base points so Y0 is taken to Y0 prime. So I stated this last time and I didn't mention they were connected if you don't have that, of course, um, you can have trivial covers of X of all kinds of forms. Uh, you can take X itself, or you can take many copies of X multiplied by an arbitrary discrete set, um, and they wouldn't suddenly not be isomorphic. Okay, so this is uh, going ways into this th uh, theorem that I've been hinting um, and which I'll finally state completely today. So we're going to associate to a covering Y of X, um, a connected covering of Y of X, the image of the fundamental group of Y, which we already saw is a subgroup via the covering map P um, lower star. And um, we're going to have a sort of a bijection between covers with a fixed base point and subgroups of the fundamental group of the base. Okay. Um, the other issue is um, the existence of, of universal covers. Is there a question? Yeah? So an isomorphism, uh, he's asking what an isomorphism is, is a homeomorphism between the spaces that uh, is compatible with the maps. So that uh, if you have the, so this triangle, we have y, phi, y prime, p, p prime to x, so that these two things commute. So going this way, you same as that way. And you have a homeomorphism backwards doing the same thing, okay? So this, I wrote it in symbols, but if you want a picture, that would be it. And to make this, um, so um, I also want to include the statement about the base points to have the statement precisely as it is there. If you change base points, uh, what happens to the fundamental group? We are always in, in the, I didn't write the hypothesis, we want X to be path connected and locally path connected. So if you have such a space X, um, so if you have a connected, sorry, a path connected space, what happens to the fundamental group? How does this depend on the base point? It's conjugation, not just isomorphism, but conjugation. So the groups are conjugate. Okay, so 
if I don't, if I'm not careful about um, the base points, if I ignore the base points, what happens is that these two groups, well, I can say is that they're conjugate to each other. But if we are careful about keeping track of base points, then uh, the statement is that uh, the groups are on the nose the same. Okay, so the existence of universal cover is something um, important. It's good to have a universal cover. Many, many things can be done with it, and arguments simplify if you have it. Um, so here I'm going to spend just a little bit on the technicalities of this question because it's going to be uh, the case that to in, in order to ensure that there exists a universal cover of a space, you not only need it to be path connected and locally path connected, but you need some other new technical thing that we haven't seen. Okay, so you'll need the three hypotheses which are going to be satisfied by most spaces you ever want to consider, but they're technically uh, completely logically independent of each other. Okay, so I'm just going to state it. I don't want to spend um, uh, unnecessarily long time on it. Okay, so let's, um, let's look at this question. So we have a covering. So recall that a universal cover means a cover of the space that is simply connected. We would like to be able to say that if X is sufficiently well-behaved space, it has a simply connected cover. And we've seen examples of this already. Um, you know, S1 has R, R has R. Um, we looked at the figure eight knot and we drew this picture. So we would like to know to what extent we can always uh, uh, be sure we have such a universal cover. Okay, so we have a covering map. And let's assume that uh, is, it is a um, universal cover. So pi one of y uh, with respect to some base point is trivial. Okay, so recall from the definition of covering that if you have a point x in the base, it has a neighborhood that um, covers, that is evenly covered, okay? So if you have a path sigma in uh, this in U, we can lift it to Y to, um, well, let's say um, to V. And because um, Y is simply connected, um, this lift sigma twiddle is isotop is homotopic to a point, to a constant map. So that means that the same happens downstairs because you can um, apply P to the homotopy and show that this path, which is sigma, is also homotopic to a point. Um, why? So that means, and this um, so what we conclude is that x, that every point in x has a neighborhood 
um, were all uh, loops are homotopic to a point. So we have a Okay, so um, we're going to call this property semi-locally, semi-local path connected, uh, simply connected. And again, uh, I don't think we should uh, lose our sleep on this technical issues, but this is the exact, um, so this is a necessary condition for the existence of a universal cover because the existence of the universal cover provides for you these um, open neighborhoods with this property. And the point is that the converse is true. So a connected locally path connected X um, has a universal cover if and only if it is locally simply connected. So this is the technical precise statement And as I said, um, most of the spaces you want to consider are going to, that satisfy the first two conditions are going to satisfy the third as well. But uh, you can, of course, it's an interesting challenge. You can see in Fulton's book, in fact, um, an example of spaces that, that don't quite satisfy all of the things at the same time. But the point, um, I want to keep, and given that we really don't have enough time to elaborate on all of this sufficiently well. Um, so as you know, today is the last lecture that I give. Uh, next time, uh, uh, Lothar Getsche will continue, and he will start with homology. So it will be a you know, shift of gears, and it will be a slightly different topic. I mean, always within algebraic geometry, but I don't think he will be mentioning much about the fundamental group. So I, you know, it would require a lot more time to go through all, all of this in, in uh, more carefully. Okay, but the point that we should keep then from this is basically, if we have a, you know, if we want to say it quickly, uh, if you have a well-behaved path, uh, uh, path-connected space, then um, it will have a universal cover. And because of the statement that we proved, uh, or at least mentioned before, if, it, um, if we apply this proposition to the case of a simply, con simply connected spaces, um, pi one of, if both y and y prime are uh, simply connected, then pi one of them is trivial, and therefore so is going to be the images, and so any two simply connected covers uh, that are connected um, are going to um, be isomorphic covers. So once you have the existence of a universal cover, is 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 unique up to isomorphism. Okay, and again, something I mentioned several times. If you like, or if you're familiar with Galois theory, this is equivalent to the existence of an algebraic closure of a field. Yeah, that you can you construct it in somewhat abstract way. And it's not, I mean, there isn't a God-given way to s express the algebraic closure, right? I mean, you, you can create different algebraic closures, but they're going to be isomorphic. Is there a question? No. Okay. Um, so let me continue then with this. Um, 
this, uh, the story of the fundamental group. I want to eventually end. So what I'd like to do today is uh, end with the, the description of this e equivalence between subgroups and covers that I mentioned, and also um, talk about the Van, Van Kampen theorem, which is the possibly the most powerful tool that allows you to compute uh, fundamental groups. Okay. So let me. Right, so you could look, as I said, in uh, Fulton's book for examples of, um, of these different concepts. Just one last phrase about this. Um, here we use the word semi-local, simply connected, and you could be wondering rightly what is local, simply connected. And uh, those presumably are different notions, and uh, they are. And um, here we're claiming in semi-local that there is a property about, so there exists a neighborhood with a certain property. In the case of locally simply connected, you want this sort of standard idea of local, which is that every neighborhood contains a neighborhood which is simply connected. So stronger than this one. Okay. Anyway, the, these sort of very technical matters, I don't think we should uh, be too much concerned with, but in a in, in spirit of being precise and giving correct statements, that's what, what is required for the existence of universal cover. A somewhat weaker uh, condition than just having a, this, this um, every neighborhood having a simply connected sub neighborhood. Okay, so here now, uh, this is finally a bit more of meat to this story. Um, so let's again consider the situation of a covering. Um, X is path connected and locally path connected. So this issue was mentioned, uh, arose last time that I used the word connected plus locally path connected, and somebody mentioned uh, soon we consider it to be path connected. So should I put the word, take the word path out or leave it in? Well, it doesn't really matter because the, the, um, the space is assumed to be locally path connected, okay? So every path connected, every connected component of a locally path connected is path connected. Okay. So anyway, again, this is getting too um, picky on the technicalities. Um, but this is uh, sufficient um, as a correct hypothesis for what I want to say. So. What we've been saying is that we have a um, covering, and I'm going to assume my top space is also path connected. So there's no funny issues with various sort of slices or something. And attached to this covering, we uh, have an object uh, which is the subgroup or the fundamental group. We'll fix some base point where zero. This is a subgroup of the fundamental group downstairs. So we have a y zero mapping to an x zero here. Okay, so we uh, we're trying to understand what exactly is the connection between the subgroup H and the covering itself. 
And um, so here's what we have. So let's look at the group of automorphisms of the covering. That is to say, let's look at all the maps um, of homeomorphisms between y, from y to itself, that um, commute with p. So p of phi is p, and preserving the base point, so taking y0 to uh, y0. So this is part of the, no, uh, sorry, I take that back. I don't want that. Um, so this is true, but it, this is part of the definition of P. Don't need it in the set. Sorry, take it back. I just look at maps that commute with P in the sense. Okay, so this is called the group of automorphisms of the cover. or also called deck transformations. Okay. So the claim is that um, the automorphisms of the cover are naturally isomorphic to the normalizer of H over H. So H is a subgroup of pi 1 of X. The normalizer of H, this is um, in pi 1 of X. It consists of all the elements um, G of pi 1, such that G H G inverse uh, gives you back <coughs> or takes you back into H. Okay, so from this, so the thing to notice here that these are two groups that are uh, a priori com sort of different objects, right? One has to do with homeomorphism of the space Y to itself uh, that preserve the map P, the covering P, and the other one is something to do with the fundamental group of the base. Okay. So, in particular, if um, Y is simply connected, what can we conclude? Well, let's see. Um, if y is simply connected, pi 1 of y is trivial, right? So our h is trivial. So this h is the trivial group. What is the normalizer of the trivial group? Anything. The whole group. Anything will take, will, you know, g1, g inverse is always 1. So any g will do. So this, uh, the normalizer of the trivial group is the entire group you're doing the normalizer from. So in this case, n of h, so, well, h is 1, the trivial group. n of h is the whole group. And what then can we conclude? This statement says that the automorphisms of the cover 
are isomorphic to the fundamental group. So this is um, an important uh, fact. And in a sense, is what we used to prove that the fundamental group of the circle was the integers. Okay. So you can think of this with Salter saying, this is giving us a way to describe the fundamental group of a space by saying, well, you somehow find the universal cover, and then you compute the automorphisms of the cover, which typically would might be an easier thing to consider. Again, if you think in terms of, uh, in the spirit of Galois theory, think of X as the base field, Y as the um, al algebraic closure, and this will be the Galois group of the algebraic closure. So in this language, the fundamental group of a space is like the algebraic closure of, sorry, the Galois group of the algebraic closure of the field over itself. Okay. Okay, so let's um, try to prove this. So let's try to get a handle on what these uh, automorphisms are. So let's say we have two points y0 and y1 in the pre-image of our base point x0. Okay, so, well, first notice that if we have such a map phi automorphism that preserves P, um, what should phi do to say y0? Where should it go? Well, phi has to commute with p, right? So if you have a point y0 that maps to x0 down here, it has to go over there to some point that also maps to, y, to x0. So if you take a point in the pre-image in the fiber about x0, then this automorphism has to take you to another point also in the same fiber. So what it's going to do is it's going to move around the points um, on top of x0 or about, uh, above x0 was arbitrary, so about any point. OK. <clears throat> but we want to connect this, auto, um, this automorphism group with something to do with the, the um, fundamental group downstairs. So. The space upstairs is path connected, so pick gamma, a path in Y going from Y0 to Y1. So what does this path do for us? We have on one hand the fundamental group based at um, y0, and on the other, the fundamental group based at y1. See that one picture here, y0, and it goes to y1. So what do we discuss about these two groups when they're connected by a path gamma? Hmm? They conjugate, right? So you basically follow the path to y1. Then if you have a loop at the y1 and you come back, that goes, tells you, allows you to go, give a path in y1 to a path in y0. So um, 
I think I, let me see if I get this in the right direction. So I first, uh, so if I have a path in Y1, um, I first do gamma, which I, is here. Uh, let me call this path gamma twiddle. And then when I, once I do the looping gamma one, I take the inverse to come back. Okay, so now let's call P gamma the composition. So pull it down. What kind of path is gamma? Is a loop, right? Because y0 and y1 are both in the fiber about x0. So once I project things down, we're going to have a path that starts at x0 and ends at x0. So gamma is a loop in x. Excuse me? At x0. So if I take um, take image images by p of this equality here, I'm going to get um, p lower star of pi one of y y zero equals to the class gamma p lower star pi 1, y, y 1, gamma inverse. Okay, so H is what we called um, this group, right? So now we can could repeat this story for any gamma in the fundamental group of the base, it will, be lift, it will lift the same gamma twiddle, so the same identity will hold. So um, so the point to make here is that gamma inverse H gamma is p lower star of pi 1 of y comma y 1. So if we want to capture when such a gamma is in the normalizer of h, so this class is in the normalizer of h, well, that means that this is equal to uh, H, so this will only be, this is equal to H if and only if that is equal to H because they're the same. So this is if and only if P lower star pi one Y, Y zero is equal to P lower star Y pi one Y, Y one. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so we want to characterize what elements in the full fundamental group normalize our subgroup H, and we just saw 
that it translates into this statement. Well, now, what does that statement say? As an equivalent form of the statement that we discussed earlier. The first thing we did, or the second. No, the first thing we did today. This statement is equivalent to what? That there is an isomorphism between the covers Y with base point Y0 and the cover Y with base point Y1. Okay, so there is a map phi that com makes this diagram commute and phi of Y0 is equal to Y1. And it's equivalent to this. So we then can jump over and co connect the first with the third. And so a gamma, a path gamma, um, is in the normalizer, a path gamma that when you lift it goes between y0 and y1, if and only if there is a automorphism that goes, um, that takes y0 to y1. Okay. So, so we can um, look at this association a little more closely. And so what we um, just did is associate to somebody in the normalizer of H some automorphism of the cover. And uh, it's not hard to see that this association is a homomorphism. Okay. <clears throat> and it's, um, why is it subjective? Yes. Suppose we have an automorphism. It takes y0 to some point y1, which are on the fiber of x0. Um, why does it come from some um, element in the normalizer the way we constructed it? Well, what would be the gamma you would pick? is the path that goes from y0 to y1. And so if you follow this construction back, you'll get another, possibly a different automorphism that takes y0 to y1. Why is it the same as the one you started with? Because y is connected and? basically by the uniqueness of all these liftings that we discussed, okay? So once this map, any one of these isomorphisms is completely determined once you know where it takes 1.2. Okay, so this shows that this map is subjective, and um, so now we like to show that the kernel is, um, is H, And so what would be the kernel? It will, we'd, we, we associate uh, automorphisms with paths upstairs. And we, we just said that the, path, the automorphisms are completely determined by where they take one of the points. 
on the fiber. And so, in particular, we're going to get the trivialized idomorphism if what? If y0 goes to... y0 to itself. Once you know that y0 goes to y0, then it has to be the identity automorphism. And so what is the gamma path uh, associated to this? It has to be a path that starts at y0 and ends in y0. So it has to be the class of a loop. Okay? And so that means that when you project it down, that would be exactly somebody in the group H. So the kernel of this map is H. Because uh, if, so phi of y0 equal to y0 is the same as saying that phi is the identity of y, which is the same as saying that the path gamma belongs to h. Okay, so maybe there's a little bit thinking there to do, but not hard. So, okay, so let's review... What is it that we proved? Because this is a very uh, important uh, fact. So we considered this group of automorphisms of the cover. And what we argued is that it's isomorphic to the normalizer of the H, this group H that we attach to the cover itself, and possibly the most useful corollary or instance of this statement is the case where y itself is simply connected, in which case the normalizes it everything, and you identify the automorphism group of, of the cover with the fundamental group of the base. Okay, so let me finally state the, uh, the statement um, that I hinted at several times. And um, I think we, we've proved a significant amount of it. Uh, I think I'll just state it. So x is path connected. Um, locally path connected. Semi-locally simply connected. So all of this is a big mouthful. Um, and we are, the statement is that if we look at covers of our space X together with a choice of base point which are connected or what's the same that they're path connected because in a covering you're going to be able if it if it's connected, you're going to be able to connect it by lifting paths downstairs. Up to isomorphism, isomorphisms that preserve base points, then there's a one-to-one -one correspondence with subgroups of the base, of the fundamental group of the base. And the association is that you take a covering, y goes to x, and you attach to it the subgroup consisting of the image by the covering p lower star um, of the fundamental group upstairs. And this is in a sense, the, the exact analog of the fundamental theorem of Galois theory. Okay. So interpreted uh, correctly, it tells you how to go between subgroups and coverings, where in Galois theory you go between subgroups and extensions. Okay. Of course, if you do infinite Galois theory, you have to be a bit more careful in the statement, but roughly speaking, this is the, the style of result. Now, if you're not worried about base points, then if you don't specify things about base points, then you don't really have a group, a subgroup of the fundamental group. What you have is a conjugacy class of groups because 
If you don't specify the base point, there's no way to tell which exact group it is that you're talking about. You're going to get possibly different conjugates of it. So if you relax this statement, and so if you ignore ignoring base points, you're going to get a bijection between connected covers up to isomorphism and conjugacy classes, or rather, let me put it this way, the same as before, uh, modular conjugation. Okay, and in this association, so this would be sort of one form of it, a little bit more precise and there will be less precise form of this correspondence. Um, in this correspondence, the trivial subgroup corresponds to the universal cover. So you see that implicit in this statement is the existence of the universal cover. That's why you need all these three hypotheses on your base space X in order to guarantee that such a universal cover exists. Okay, so... I think I'm going to leave this uh, statement um, for that, uh, as like that for now, because I only have a little bit more of time and I want to discuss the Van Kampen theorem. So there's a bit more that one can elaborate on this theory that um, I'll invite you to read on your own, or if you want to discuss it further, you can always come talk to me later, but I'm not going to discuss it in class. because. We're running out of time. Um, except that perhaps I typically like to think of examples with uh, complicated concepts. So uh, why don't we give it a little bit of a few minutes of thought to trying to un understand this statement in the context of, uh, for example, these coverings of, uh, of the... Um, figure eight knot that we were discussing. Again, um, I, th I mentioned this several times. You should, I encourage you to actually do something like this. You know, take some uh, examples like this, coverings of a, of a space, and try to understand the various theorems that we proved, various facts, in the, li in light, in the light of the examples. So I don't make sure you understand uh, the examples um, as deeply as possible as a way to internalize what the theorems say. Um, but for that, I probably should add one um, statement. Um, no, maybe not. Um, okay. Uh, let's see what we can do. Um, let's look at this cover number one. Can you see it? Maybe I'll write it down here. Um, we have the two points. A, so this is examples. A, and then B. Which is the cover of the figure eight node. Okay, so uh, what, so this is a cover, this is a Y, this is our X. This group is the free group generated by A and B. So this cover gives us a subgroup of this, of what index? Two, right, because it's a degree two cover, yeah? What is the group of automorphisms of this cover? Automorphisms of the cover. So this is our Y, mapping to our X. Automorphisms Y, X. Hmm? 
I can't quite hear. Two, two elements. He's saying that the two elements in the automorphism group is so therefore z mod two z. No, it can be in any no other group if it has two elements. Why is that? And it has degree two. What did we prove about the automorphism group of the cover? It's equal to, the, it's isomorphic to the normalizer of the group that it corresponds to the cover modulo the, by the way, notice that this is actually a quotient in the group's theory sense because a group A, any group, a subgroup H is normal in its normalizer, right? You basically build this normalizer to, so that every element in the normalizer actually normalizes the subgroup. So it's normal. So it makes sense to talk about its quotient. It's not H is not necessarily normal in the whole group. That would only be the case if the normalizer is everything. So this automorphism group is, is isomorphic to the normalizer of H divided by H. So what is the normalizer? Well, um, H is a subgroup of index two. Any group, any subgroup of index two is normal. Okay, so the normalizer is the whole thing, so this is isomorphic to Z mod two Z. So can we, what could the, this one non-identity homomorphism from the Y to itself, we should be able to see it. What do you think? What should it do to the points one and two to begin with? This is our phi, right? A phi goes from y to itself, and these two points are in the fiber of that point. So what should this phi do? It has to permute these points. If it fixes one of them, it's the identity. So the only thing that is left, it has to flip these two. So if I take this cover and do this, will that be a deck transformation? Would that be a phi, an element of the automorphism group? Yeah. OK. It has to be. OK, let's look at uh, the next one, or, or number three in this list. Okay, so what degree is this cover? Three. So the index of H in the whole pi one is three. Okay, so what is the automorphism group of this cover? What are the possibilities? It has index three. So the normalizer is something that contains it. I mean, the normalizer always is a group on top of the group you started with. Everybody in H normalizes H just because it's a subgroup. So normalizer is, could be anything, has to be something possibly bigger. It's either H or something uh, all the way up to the full group. So if it has index three, what are the possibilities for the normalizer? It's either H or is the whole group. There's no other group in between. So either is the whole group, in which case the subgroup H is normal, or it isn't, and the normalizer is H itself. So the automorphism group has two possibilities. What could it be? If the normalizer is everything, then the normalizer of H divided by H is isomorphic to what? It's a group of order three. 
So it has to be cyclic of order three. And if the normalizer of H is H, the, the automorphism group is trivial. So it's either trivial or it has a order three automorphism. So stare at this picture and tell me what you think it is. So, for example, this point will have to go over to some point that looks like it. So this guy has a cycle of B attached to it. So where could it go? It can't go anywhere. There's no other point in here that looks like it. Right? This one doesn't have a loop B attached to it. This one hasn't, doesn't have a loop B attached to it. So in fact, it's the identity. Okay, so this cover has no, um, no automorphisms. And in fact, if you, if you switch the, the base point, what you're going to see are three different subgroups. So if, this means that the normalizer is itself, which means that there are three different conjugates of this subgroup inside the whole pi 1. And that will correspond precisely as to picking the three different uh, base points do that, you're going to get a subgroup of the a group downstairs that is going to be, uh, for each choice, a different subgroup. Anyway, I think I'll stop with this subject and move to the Van Kampen theorem, which is somewhat unfortunate because it's a big deal, and, um, and I'll, we won't have time to dedicate it as it deserves. Um, but I think I feel uh, pretty bad if we went through this course without even mentioning this statement. So find Campion theorem. And um, I believe that uh, Getsche is going to cover, as I said, homology, and you're likely to see the mayer Villatoris um, theorem, which is a homology form of this theorem. So this, the, um, the, the issue at hand is the following. We have a space X, which is constructed as a union of two open sets, U1, U2. And we want to relate the fundamental group of X to that of the three spaces U1, U2, and U1 intersect U2. In order to give um, the answer to the, the result in this theorem, we need to discuss what it means to take the free product of groups. So if we have two groups, G1 and G2, we define G1 star G2. This is the symbol for free product of groups. And is defined as follows. The elements of G1 star G2 are words in G1 union G2. So think of um, words meaning strings of symbols. Each one of the elements of this word is taken either from G1 or from G2. So at the moment, I just have long strings of symbols, each one of them coming from either one of these two groups. We can certainly, we're going to define a multiplication of, of words by just concatenation. If you have two words, you just put them one after the other. So that gives you a way to multiply words. 
And that would not make you make this into a group. So um, you also um, want to have some notion that a multiplication that came from the groups themselves. So what we're going to do is mod out by a relation, um, which is that if you have an A1 um, and a B1, a BI, BI that belongs to GI, and if you see AI, BI next to each other in your word, so this is our word W, then this should be equivalent to the same thing but where now you replace the pair AI, BI by the product of them, where the product is done in the original group they belonged. So if I have an orange and an apple, I don't do anything with them. If I have an orange and an apple following, but if I have two oranges together, I put them together and I make a double orange. Okay? So you multiply elements of the group if they happen to be in the same group, because you know how to do that, and if they don't belong to the same group, you just leave them as they are. Okay, so, well, again, it take, uh, to do this formally takes, it's a bit tedious, but hopefully you can see how this works. This will produce for us a group, which is called the, the free product of the two groups. And there is a categorical way to define this. So if you have a G1 and a G2, then we have the free product of the groups, which have maps, because uh, you can look at a word consisting of just an element of G1 or just an element of G2, and um, so there is a there are homomorphisms like this, and this construction is universal to the property that if you have any map from G1 to G and G2 two maps to a group G, then there is a unique map that goes from the free product. So it's sort of universal with respect to this property. Anyway, but that's not quite uh, too relevant for us at the moment. Um, just to get a, maybe a handle on this concept, what happens if both groups G1 and G2 are the integers? What you think? Do you think it's G one free product G two? So let's go one at a time. I heard one thing. What, what are you suggesting? You say it's Z or Z? Uh, how about back there somewhere? An option. Free group generated by two elements. Something else? Well, let's try to follow the construction, see what we would get. So um, Z has is the same one, so we want to distinguish them so we don't get confused. So let's call a generator one over Z's A and a generator one of the other Z's to be B. So what would be the words? Well, we just have a collection of um, A's to some power, possibly negative power, then some B's, then some A's, and then some B's, and so on. And if we see a whole bunch of A's, we just squish them together and put A to the right power. And if we see B's together, we squash them together. So at the, ad, at the end of the day, I have now a word which consists of A to a power, B to a power, A to a power, B to a power, and so on. And the only thing I can do is if I see an A um, next to each other, I can add the exponents. So if I see a to the 5 and a to the minus 5, well, I, I can cancel those out. So which we'll need to do to multiply things out. And so what we get is what we were discussing before, the free group in two elements. So this is um, F2, free group in um, two generators. And what we discussed, and we did a little bit in, towards proving, this group is actually the fundamental group of what? 
of the figure 8 node. And in fact, now once I state the van Kampen theorem, it will be a simple consequence of the theorem that that's the case. Okay. We kind of argued a bit uh, loosely last time, but this will be a, a different approach in a very uh, unambiguous and rigorous way to do that. So what's the theorem? So in the simplest form, so simple form first. You can probably guess it by now. So uh, I probably have to assume various things. So U1, U2, U1 intersecting U2, I want them to be path connected. And so in the simple form, I will also assume that U1 intersect U2 is simply connected. Okay, and so X is the union, and the theorem is that pi 1 of X is isomorphic to the free product of pi 1, let me put it X0, zero, zero, uh, X zero. pi 1, X0 is somebody in the intersection, so it makes sense to talk about these two groups. So it's the free product of the fundamental groups of each one of the open sets. Okay, so this is great and is a powerful tool to calculate and, and understand various, uh, the fundamental groups of various complicated spaces. So um, as I said, unfortunately, I'm not even going to try to give you a hint of how you prove it. It's not particularly difficult, but it's kind of long and, and uh, tedious. If you can look it up in Hatcher, and he does it in his full generality. Uh, Fulton takes a slightly simpler appro approach. If you already know that the spaces in question have uh, universal covers, then the proof is a little easier. But regardless, we're not going to um, do that here. So I'll just go ahead and use it. So let's take our space X to be our loved little eight. Okay. So I'm going to take, say, U1 to be this open set. Okay. U2 to be this open set and then the intersection is this open set. So uh, what can we say about the fundamental group of the intersection? It's trivial because, because why? It's contractible, right? You can contract every path. So it fits precisely in the hypothesis of the theorem. Pi 1 of U1, the point, and pi 1, U2, the point, are both isomorphic to Z. Because this little extra leg theory we can contract, each open set looks like a circle. It's a homotopy type of a circle. So each one of them has a Z. And now what this theorem says is then the fundamental group of the um, figure eight is the free product of Z cross Z. And we argued that's, um, well, that's exactly what we said before, that that's a free group in two elements. So if you like the definition of a free group of two elements, you can take it to be precisely that is the free product of Z cross Z. Okay, so what would happen if you have three, a bouquet of three circles? 
what is it, sorry, uh, the, why, why this, so I haven't uh, written any conclusion. Um, so the theorem implies, okay, so please tell me again what um, is your question? The theorem, or? So the theorem says that if we have two open sets, that it, their union is our space X, such that all three spaces, the open sets and their intersections, are path connected. Then, um, and on top, in this form of the theorem, the intersection is simply connected, right? Then, um, the that's an assumption. All of this up to here are assumptions. This is the conclusions. Maybe then. So if, then. Okay? So if the intersection is simply connected, then we have the statement that the fundamental group of the union is the free product of the uh, fundamental groups of each one of the open sets. Is that, is that clear? Okay. Um, so, if we had a bouquet of circles, so the figure, not eight anymore, but that was the fundamental group of that. Yes, we can do it as we did before. And what would you get? Sorry, let, let, me, let me finish. Yeah, go ahead. We would get the free product of the four circles that we see, indeed. So we would have, for each one of the petals of this flower, we would get a copy of Z. And if you iterate the argument that we did just now, you would get Z, free product Z, free product Z, four times. So the fundamental group here would be isomorphic to the free group in four um, generators, okay, which is the same as z for z for z for z for z. Good. So we would take a lot more work to try to figure that out without this theorem. So it is, it is a pretty um, powerful theorem. All right, now, how about what's wrong with this? So take x to be s1 and take u1 to be this open set and u2, say, with a one base point there and u2 to be this. Each one of the, them is simply connected, right? Okay, so does this contradict the theorem? Why not? Right, if you take the intersection, this consists of two pieces, which is not path connected. And this is very crucial then for the hypothesis of the theorem that you are in the situation where all three pieces of this are path connected. Um, let's do um, another example. Um, let's take X to be the two-sphere, okay? We already proved that the pi one of the two-sphere is trivial. We did it for any sphere of any dimension bigger than one. But let's do it again using Van Kampen theorem, and we'll see that is a lot easier than all the maneuverings we need to do before. So how would you do this? Hmm? We can take the sort of top half and the bottom half. So 
going down a little bit so there's a bit of space below so they have a non-trivial intersection. So we have, this is U1 and U2. Except that I now realize that I haven't, <laughs> we can't do it yet. What's the intersection? It's a little ribbon, right? So it's not, it's con path connected, but it's not simply connected. So I cannot ap ap apply the theorem as we have it. So I'll, I'll have to postpone it because uh, I need now to give you the form of the theorem that is the full form, not without the assumption of simply connectedness of the intersection. Okay, so let me give you the general form. Okay, so hold on a minute for this example. So the general form of the theorem So the hypotheses are the same, except we no longer assume that the intersection is simply connected. And so the conclusion in this case is that pi 1 of x, x0, let me write it out, and then we'll discuss what it means. So there's a bit of a mouthful of symbols there. So the, to say this in words, you would say this is the free product with amalgam or just an amalgam. Okay, and to describe this, um, let's go back to our groups, G1 and G2. They have maps to um, this free product, but there is also um, possibly a uh, subgroup H that may be maps to both. So um, if we follow H down the top arrows, we'll end up with a subgroup of the, um, of the free product if we, um, if we uh, follow it from below we get a different subgroup and so what we like to uh, um, force is the fact that um, we want the two subgroups to be the same uh, to have the same image so an H viewed through this path on the top or the maps on the bottom should end up giving us the same element in the image. And so what we're going to do is just impose those relations. I'm trying to find the formal definition. Sorry, is there? So I uh, suppose you have the G1 and G2. Free product with amalgam? So what we're going to define is G1, free product G2, with an H below. Okay? And an H is going to be a, a, another third group that will have a map to both G1 and G2. Okay? And we want those images to, co to coincide in the, um, in the group that we're constructing. So what we're going to do is take the free product of G1 and G2 and divide by the uh, subgroup, normal subgroup generated by those relations. So let me, um, give me a second. I'll, I want to give you the precise form. Um, I've written it out, but I don't have it.
So we want um, the, if you want, uh, maybe I'll put an H here. What we want of this group is, um, is the universal property that um, if you have any map from G1, G2 to another group G, um, so if you have a group G and a map, and two maps like this, that agree on, um, so we should give these things names. This is I1, I2, and this is uh, H1 and H2. This is J1 and J2. So if um, H1 composed with Y1, I1 is equal to H2 composed with I2, so going this way and going this way is the same, then we want the existence of a map here. Then there exists um, the, the uh, map um, here. So it's universal with respect to the property not only that you have maps from G1 and G2, but those maps agree once you restrict them to the image of the subgroup H. So one way to think of this is what I was saying earlier, is that you basically take the words in G1 and G2 to form the free product, and then you divide by the uh, smallest normal subgroup so that you can make a quotient of groups such that um, the, um, the images of, both, uh, uh, of H through both of these maps into G1 and G2 agree. And of course, if the H happens to be the trivial group, the trivial subgroup, then the images are the trivial subgroup, and then there's no condition. You know, the trivial group will always be the trivial group, no matter, no matter where it comes from. And so, the, um, so if H is the trivial group, then G1, G2, it's just G1, G2, the free product. So um, the statement that uh, I wrote for the fundament, uh, for the Van Kampen theorem is as the other ex case, was a um, special case of this one. In the case when this is simply connected, this is one, and then I don't need to worry about this amalgam business. Okay? All right, so let's see if we can uh, get a sense of this theorem in the remaining time. So let's go back to the case that I had to stop because I realized I don't have the statement yet. So here's our sphere. Yes? What is the relationship between, for the maps that I wrote? Okay. The I's and the J's and so on? What is this map? Yes. No, this is just a way to state what the group G1, uh, free group G2 over H is. You can define it in this categorical way that gives you a clean way to identify it, but it doesn't tell you quite what it is. So the universal property that I want is that this group is a group such that if you have two maps, H1 and H2, into any other group G, such that the compositions all the way to H agree, then there is a map from this one to the G. So it's the universal one in the sense it's the smallest group that has this property. Any other group you can achieve this way, you can reach this way, can, you can do it through this one. So it's a typical sort of universal type construction that unfortunately doesn't necessarily give you a big in insight as to what it is. I tend to like to think is, is um, the idea is that you have these versions of elements of G1 and G2 where whenever you see a, a, 
an image of H that came from one group, it has to equal the image of H that came from the other group. Okay, so um, let's try this. If we go back to our sphere, okay, we had uh, these two um, semispheres. So what is pi 1 of each one of these? Of the two open sets is one, right? Is this is a contract? Is a disk? Is this is the same as a disk? Is is a um, contractible space? So this is one. What is um, pi one of this? Z. But in fact, it doesn't matter because what is the theorem telling us? The Van Kampen theorem says that pi 1 of the sphere is isomorphic to the free product of the trivial group with itself over the image of um, z. So it, the, the problem is that the notation is kind of bad because it's not z, but sort of the image of z by these maps. And the image of z by these maps have to be trivial because all of, of both are the trivial group. So basically we're saying we take the free product of the trivial group with itself, which is the trivial group, and we identify in it the images of Z, which has to be the trivial group, the trivial group. so we don't do any identification. I mean, it's, you take the quotient of the trivial group, you're never going to get anything smaller than the trivial group. So the fact that this was Z or whatever is, for this example, not relevant. Okay, so fortunately, there's a bit of a long story that uh, I had to cut to a little bit of time, but I just felt that this was um, ludicrous not to cover this term in this class. So I'll, I'll finish with one example, and I think we'll, we'll stop there. Um, let's compute um, Let's try to compute the fundamental group of the torus by using this theorem. We know it already. We've seen it in a different way, in a way much in a simpler way, but let's try this. So I think of the torus of my square with identifications. Okay, so let's take U1 to be this open set that contains a point that is going to be our base point, and U2 that is a little bit smaller hole that is the complement. So the union of these two open sets is the whole uh, torus. So we could use Van Kampen's theorem, path connected and everything else. What's the intersection? A little, little uh, annulus, right? Because you know, we take this a little bigger than the other one, so when you cut this out of that one, we're going to see something like this. Okay, so what are the fundamental groups here? Let's be careful. What is the fundamental group of U1? Hmm? I, I didn't quite understand what you said. Just Z, the, the integers? Everybody happy with that? Uh, no, 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 it's trivial, it's trivial. I thought it's outside. It's trivial? Yes. Sorry. I'm less happy. <laughs> this is the same as a fundamental group of the torus minus a point, which in fact 
is something worth thinking about. Well, what happens? Take, take that open set that we cut out and make it bigger. You know, ex, ex, expand it all the way to the end. So what do you get at the end? You get a square with those identifications, nothing inside. What is that? Sure, are you sure? Well, we have an A and an A and a B and a B. The A and the B never mix. Okay, so if you look at, at this thing we, with only the edges, we're going to have the A that goes to the, a point. All the four points in the corner are the same point in the, in the quotient. And the B is another one. So what you get is actually the figure eight. Uh, I, th I, see, I see your problem, and I take it back. I'm thinking of this example. <laughs> I, sorry, I just got confused. I mean, this, sorry, let me, I apologize. You were right, this is the trivia group. We're talking about the shaded stuff, right? That is certainly is trivial, excuse me. So I was thinking of this. Sorry, I missed, uh, misspoke. Are we, are we okay now? Okay, so how about this? This is an annulus, so this is Z. So this is the free group in two elements. This is trivial, and this is Z. Now, that in itself doesn't tell us what the group is, because the maps are the thing that matter. You need to know how this, so the Z maps to there and maps to there, but um, you need to know how it maps there before you can think of what the result is. Just the fact that it's Z and the free group doesn't tell you much. What it tells you is that the, the, the group in question is, um, well, the, what does Van Kampen theorem say? It says we take the trivial group F2 with the amalgamation of this copy of Z in it. This is the same as F2 uh, modulo the uh, normal subgroup generated by by the image of this circle of Z. So what is the image? Well, we have to look at this circle that we see here and see what it looks like in the fundamental group of this. Right? So this loop there, inside the torus, what is it? This is our base point. Well, it's the same as going around, um, around the, uh, the outside. You can, you can open this up and make it look like um, like this. So this, this path here is A, B, A inverse, B inverse. So the conclusion is that the fundamental group of the torus is isomorphic to the a group generated by A and B, that's the free group, modulo the relation that A, B, A inverse, B inverse. So what this is, is Z cross Z. Not star Z, not just the normal Cartesian product. So A, B, A inverse, B inverse equal to one means that A and B commute in the quotient. And so you have a free group with two commuting generators. And that gives you Z cross Z. All right, so we'll stop here. And you'll continue with homology next time. Thank you.